So, hang on. You are you hopping in? Yeah, let's do it. Uh oh, Joshua got, Sheehy. Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> we see enough of you, Josh. You can't get grants of the camera time. What's up, people? Welcome back to the Change Over Podcast. My name is Justin Roberts, and I'm joined by our co-host Jordy McGinley. This week we have a pretty special guest. You may have seen him in Grigor Dimitrov's box at some of the some of the pro tournaments. One of the most energetic, most helpful, positive guys in college tennis was formerly assistant coach at UCLA. We have the head coach of the SMU Mustangs, Grant Chen. Let's join us today, Grant. Guys, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, really appreciate the invite. I was thinking that, you know, I was never going to make the cut. So, <laughs> me and, and just, I, I, I appreciate it. It's, it's been it's been fun. No, appreciate thank that. you. And we should have had you on a few weeks ago at Dallas, but obviously, you know how the, the schedule is. Like, we just try and fit, fit in the episodes when we can. So, we're glad that we can oh, get, this, get this over the of line. Of course. No, gl- glad, glad we could get this done and, and finally have this conversation and, Jody got to see you uh, definitely for a couple of days in in Dallas, and then you know I think like everything else, you just kind of what 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 cities next? Where do you go? This yeah. that? I mean, it's just life on the road. I'm for still sure. on the I'm still on the tour from that uh, from Dallas. Went straight to Michigan, straight to Davis Cup. So I'm still on that tour. So I get to take a break next week finally. That, that, that's what life on uh, on the road is like. Exactly. Can you touch a little bit on that and why that interests you so much about the management side of, of college tennis and professional tennis? Sure. Well, you know, I, I think tennis in general is, is such a business, you know, I mean, we all love the game. We all play the game. We all practice thousands and thousands of hours and hit a million tennis balls. But, you know, look, this is a business. Also, you guys are on tour and you know, representing your country, representing your college school, representing your, you know, academies that you train at or, or your, your coach or your friends. I mean, it, it's amazing the network and the family that this tennis community provides. And no matter what town you go to, you kind of, hey, uh, I'm in Dallas. Can we train? Of course. I go to New York. I go to Miami. I go to the Bahamas, anywhere, you know, and, and I think that's amazing. But as a as a whole, it is a sport. Racket companies are trying to sell rackets. Clothing companies are trying to sell shoes and clothes. Tennis clubs are trying to fill up lessons and clinics and camps and all these other things. So this whole ecosystem of what we do in tennis, I think, is very intertwined. And we've got to be able to understand that we play a role in it. You guys are out there competing. How can you also make a connection to the city? East Lansing, Bahamas, Davis Cup, Dallas. I mean, no matter where you are, in the 35 plus tournaments you guys play a year, how do we help the tournament? How do we help? It doesn't even matter. A Futures, Davis Cup, Grand Slams, Masters 1000. How can we help make a difference in all these different events? And I think if we can help drive ticket sales and participation and put butts in seats, that is the greatest thing that we can do to help each other out. But I think all of us need to open the blinders up to know that, It's much more than that. You know, we train so hard on the practice court, but also now people are doing a lot of things in the gym. And how do you do mental training and diet and sleep and study, you know, wearing the whoop bands and understanding how much their recovery they're going to need tonight. These are all little things that I think add up to become big things. So as a GM, you know, I think it's really important to understand how the entire thing works. If, If our team was number one in the country and nobody was in the stands, would I really be doing my job? I think, you know, to be able to create a home base, a fan base, people who want to come out and support people who want to watch the match, watch college tennis, watch futures matches. This is so exciting. I think some of the best matches I've seen aren't at slams. You know, I might go to the U us open for 22 days and never step foot in ash because you know there's such great action going on on the outside courts so that's what i think we all need to remember is everything we're involved in is a business and if we want to look at it larger than just tennis i think we can then help our our sport evolve well i don't know grant if people i mean what kind of feedback you receive from from your colleagues and peers but 
whenever your name comes up in conversation, that's one of the, the things people talk about is your strength as an overall manager and to see more than just on the tennis court, but to see everything holistically, like the business side of it, the the crowd, the fans, the interaction, all this stuff, um, managing everything. So I don't know if people tell you this enough, but I just wanted to tell you here that that's one of the things that people acknowledge about you and they know that that's one of your strengths. So just want to say that you're doing a good job and, and keep it up. Well, I, I appreciate that. That's kind of you to say, you know, and, and I think we all do our part. You guys have this great, great platform you guys have. You guys have created a brand the last couple of years, and it's fantastic. I'm a huge fan. I listen and love your content when you guys are, you know, whether it's Zeke or, you know, Evan or whoever it is that that comes up. I mean, it, it's so fun because, you know, some of it is content. Some of it's just banter. Some of it is just four guys sitting in the living room talking about anything, you know, and, and, and I think that's what's so fun to, to see. And, you know, for the tennis world to understand is we do kind of live in this traveling circus, you know, every single week, what do we want to know? Who, who, who do I book practice courts with? Where do I get practice balls? How do I get from the hotel to the venue? How do I, you know, where's the sandwich shop, pasta, Uber eats? I mean, all these things, it's the same questions, every single city, even just how, who am I going to practice with tomorrow? Everyone's waiting around 6, 7 p.m. at night waiting for order of play so we all know what to do tomorrow. You know, and, and people don't realize that that is one of the most oh, difficult things. Determined by a, oh, a day is determined by a piece of paper that comes out at 7 p.m. Correct. <laughs> or, or, you know or 10 p.m., 11 p.m. Or, or, or 10 p.m. Yeah, comes out. <laughs> Correct. So we're all sitting here, wait, has order of play come out? Has order of play come out? And you're like, I don't even know. You know, it was so funny. A couple of weeks ago at the Dallas event, I got the order of play. It was, it was a little bit of like a, a preview. And so I, you know, I told someone, Oh, you know, second on next thing, you know, the official one came out, it got moved to fourth. You know I mean? It just, I mean, these things, these things happen all the time, but you know, I think those are some of the things behind the scenes that, you know, some fans may not realize is we are this traveling circus. You go from Dallas to East Lansing or Dallas to Rochester, Rochester, after this, the Davis cup, fed cup, you know, and then, in a couple of weeks, all roads, you know, everyone, a lot of people head to, to New York, whether they're playing, they're coaching, they're watching, they're doing meetings out there. You're, you know, you're hosting podcasts. I mean, it just kind of all roads lead to New York in a few weeks and around the slams because during those events, there's not much else going on. So even some of my guys, I mean, they're going to become practice partners during the U S open because nice. I mean, there's no, there's, there's no tournaments to play. And then after that, what do you do? We go to the indoors, we go this, we go to Asia, we go to Europe. And, uh, you know, and I think that's the fun part, but it's also, you know, a day-to-day -day grind. And if you're not doing it for the right reasons, I, I really think it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard, but if, if we're passionate about what we do, we love what we do, we enjoy the game, then all the other stuff I think really does work itself out. Yeah. So, you know, it, we're, I think we're all very lucky to be able to be a part of this sport and how we can also then make a difference in others. So, uh, I mean, I, I love this game. All right. Next one I got for you. Team culture. Is it over underrated? And I ask this because I know you've been a part of some great teams at UCLA and you're building a, a great thing at SMU. I'm wondering if you think that having great players is enough or do you have to sort of build something where it's sort of like a family or whatever you think it is to, to have I, real success in college tennis? I, I think it's pivotal. I, I absolutely think team culture um, is, is, is significant. But beyond that, I actually think the culture and the foundation is important for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, how you handle your day-to-day -day action. You know, everyone can be a tennis pro for two hours a day on a tennis court. But what do you do the other two, 22 hours? You know, and, and I think that's, that's – it's not just about training. It's about the rest. Are you eating, sleeping? Are you doing the right things? But yet finding the right times to have some fun because, you know, you need that. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've seen players who are so good at tennis, but they're wound tight. They're nervous. They're this, they're that. So I think to have an important balance is, is tied in with the culture. So even with our team, I've always really believed to try to have a to create a positive culture and a balance is, is, is pivotal. Uh, my, my trick I usually try to use is 
revolves around food. So we have a lot of team meals, you know, Good. breakfast, lunch, dinner. Love that. We cook. We we go we go out to dinner. We we cater. We to go Uber Eats. You know, I, I think it's amazing how much fun we all have, you know, eating food and uh, <laughs> coaching a bunch of guys. Uh, they eat every two hours. So I think food is a common thread. And also in the Chinese culture and a lot of other cultures, obviously, food is a big deal. So, you know, I mean, I, you know, you just got to try to create it somehow, but it's never going to be perfect. You know, and I think that's what you want to you want to remember is, you know, there is no perfect locker room culture. You know, you, yeah. you've got you've got a, a combination of personalities, of abilities, of egos, of all that. But I, I think if you're if you're in the right direction every single day, I think that's good enough. But, you know, to think that there's this perfect team, you know, it's a little bit of a unicorn that probably doesn't exist. It's, it's a mythical thing because I think the adversity and the tough times is what leads to the proud moments. And so mm. when you do come out and, and and have a great victory or a tournament win or you win a title, it's all the weeks of frustration that you didn't win. Because that's the nature of our sport. Every week there's one singles you know, champion, one doubles champion. Everyone else lost. And then, you know, Monday you start over again. And, you know, what keeps us coming back is is those runs that we all all hopefully enjoy that, hey, we take these runs together. And it balances out because I, I think one of the hard things to do is understanding and knowing and how to how to lose because losing is tough. But if you can lose with the right way, with the right class, with the right dignity and you take it for its strengths, you know, and learn from it, it it's going to be positive. What's the locker room like at SMU uh, when there's some tough losses? How, how are the boys been handling it this season? Yeah, no, look, I, I think everyone handles it differently. And 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 me speaking for myself, I think it 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 always hits me hard. But one thing I try to do is not say too much after a, a tough loss. I I think, you know, right after the match, emotions are high. Honestly, I, I don't even I haven't even had a chance to connect with some of my um my coaching staff or the players. You know, sometimes I'm focused on one or two courts or two or three courts, and I have no idea what happens on the other three courts. So I, I've kind of uh, built a thing where after the match, I don't say a lot. I try to let everyone, you know, the emotions calm down, let everyone kind of decompress. Uh, maybe we go get food or dinner later that night or first thing in the morning. The next day we talk. And I think at yeah. that time, we've all had a time to to process the match things we did well, things we didn't do well, and then how to how to move forward for that. So, you know, I mean, not much of what you're going to say after a loss, to me, I think is productive because everyone is, is, everyone is emotional, including myself. And so when you can let a few moments pass and the next day or that night or, let, you know, let some time go by, I think you can have a much clearer conversation. Especially in college when, like, everyone's screaming and the energy is so high. The emotion has got to be high. Like, now when I scream, come on, I'm fucking lightheaded for the next 30 seconds. I can't even imagine what yeah. I was like in college, like, screaming, come on, every point. Yeah, no, you're, you're just, you know, you're 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 tired. You're, you know, you, you go on this emotional, you know, collapse. You're probably hungry. You're probably dehydrated. Some of the guys may be cramping or need medical attention. But I, I think you just got to let a you know, little time pass. And you know what? The next morning, the sun, the sun's still going to rise. And, uh, you know, we start, we start a new day, but I, yeah. I think that's what makes the, the college season, the pro season. It, it's this entire journey, you know, and when the tour ends in, you know, November, give or take, um, you kind of have this four to six window to, to train, to, to take some time off, to, to do whatever it is you need to, do before the training block and then the January builds up again. But, you know, I think being able to reflect is, is pivotal. Okay. Can we talk a little bit about recruiting grants? So yeah, absolutely. Um, in your recruiting windows, like how, what is your process? Like what kind of guys do you look for? Like, do you recruit by the position or do you recruit based on, I don't know, UTR or world tennis number? What, what's the recruiting landscape like for you and SMU? 
Sure. Well, you know, recruiting, um, I've, I've always joked that recruiting is like fashion. It never ends. You know, fashion every single day, you're trying to create something. Recruiting, everything you do is kind of recruiting based. But I, I think you've got to identify what you want to accomplish. You know, do you just want the best players? Do you want to find the right individuals with the right values, with the right character? You know, wh what is your brand about? I think if you're just looking for a bunch of players based on ratings, then all you're doing is buying players or, you know, trading players. I think what we need to remember is to find what your culture of your team is like. So I, I, I spend a lot of time to try to identify the right individuals that are going to be part of this program because every single person needs to play a role. And, and I think along those lines, you got to figure out what your team is about. You know, and, and, you know, some of the success we've had in the past, we, we didn't have the best players, but I think at certain moments we had the best team. And then we've had other instances where we have a bunch of very good players, but maybe we weren't the best team. So, you know, I think there's a lot of ways you can look at it, but it's how you put all the pieces of the puzzles together, but also having a clear idea and understanding of every everybody's role. If I'm worried about, you know, treatment and lifting exercises, then I'm not doing, I, I'm getting involved with the strength coach and then the athletic trainer. I need them to do their jobs. I need my players to do their jobs. I need the coaching staff to do their jobs. And if everyone does their job right and well, then all the pieces of the puzzle should fit in together. So from a recruiting standpoint, it's, it's making sure you identify what you want. And I think for the prospective student athlete, they need to be aware of what they're looking for. And I think too often these days, it, it's easy to get attracted to the um, a brand name school. I'm going to go to this program because it's, it's UCLA, Stanford, you know, whatever, whatever program it is. And it, these are wonderful, wonderful places, but is it right for you? And I think that's something really important to remember. And you guys all had that experience. And something I something else I would I would stress to prospective student athletes is do your due diligence and the grass is not always greener on the other side. You know, I, I'm a big I'm a big loyalty guy. In 15, 18 years, I've had one player transfer away from me. And and I think that says something. But at the same time, my daily responsibility is to continue to recruit my current team. Every single day, I'm trying to recruit my current team. So having said that, here we are. I, I think it's, you sound it's like a good husband. <laughs> you keep uh, dating date, date your wife. <laughs> you, uh, you, know, you, you might want to ask her. You know, I, I don't know if she would agree with you. But, but I think these are, these are important things about recruiting is that do you make sure that those, those players feel connected with you year round once they graduate? You know, and if that answer is yes, then I think that coach has done their, their job. I mean, you could probably just see, like, even guys who are not actually your players, like, maybe Dallas is somewhat of a central location in the U.S., but how many pros that didn't go to SMU, didn't go to UCLA, train with you guys? And even guys who didn't even go to college, I mean, a handful of those guys, too, come, come through every now and again, but, like... I think Dallas is one of those places. SMU is one of those places where you have somewhat of like a little pro team that just utilize the facility and stuff. And I haven't spoken to too many of them, but I know it's like somewhat of a little family, a group of guys there that use yeah. the facility. So I'm sure, you know, the recruiting goes beyond just like the, uh, the coming into college also is about the going out, you know, it's pretty cool. You know, but I, I think no matter where you're at, you build that family. You know, and part of why I decided to take this job and move to Dallas was I felt it was such a strong community. You know, you've got Taylor and his amazing Taylor and Jenny have this amazing academy facility that they build in Keller. And then you've got T Bar M and High Point and all these other great tennis communities uh, that have a, a tennis family. And when you have the chance to bring them all together, connect together, work together, you know, everyone can work in synergy. So, yeah, yes, here in Dallas, I, I think we've built a nice little tennis family of, of people who come by. You know, if you're in town and, and you're here often, um, you always have a place to go. You always have a place to train. So these are all the things that I think is important as we intertwine together. Um, but 
we all find that wherever we are. And I think it's important to create that no matter where we are. So, you know, just I mean, like you guys you've are also doing done now. a very good job of creating that at SMU because that's not how it is at a lot of schools. I mean, I mean, yeah, you, you go to some of these schools and you have the handful of pros that played for the program, but you're, I would say SMU is unique in the sense of you have guys that didn't play for SMU or UCLA. Some of them are not American either, and they can still drop by and do training blocks and that sort of stuff. It's, that's pretty unique to SMU, I would say. Well, you know, I, I, I love, I love the variety. I love the change. Plus I love the energy. You know, I, I think there's moments when, when you look at the, the tennis courts, they're full. You've got a 12 year old hitting, you've got a 19 year old hitting, you've got, you know, a top 10 ATP player hitting, you've got a, you know, top 500 player hitting. Everyone's there trying to get better. And, and I think there's a common thread that it's not about just the, the top, top, top. It's about the whole spectrum of athletes. And I think that's something that does create a very positive vibe because we can always look towards somebody else. We can always look up to somebody else. And, and Dallas, you know, we're very lucky. You know, um, John Isner lives a couple blocks away. He's been a huge advocate of, of tennis in the area. He trained here a lot. But I, I think he also likes to give back and help the game of tennis. And, and I think – his pathway and his journey and what everyone's done together has been able to create a, a larger, larger mission than just each, each other. Cause I think when you have the opportunity to help each other, I think we're all going to go much, much further. Yeah. Um. So back to the recruiting. So is the recruiting right now, is it still 4.5 scholarship for the men's teams? You know, the, the, the conversation in the landscape is changing quickly. Um, I think the NCAA and there's a lot of different parameters that are coming into place today. That's the story tomorrow. It could be something else. You know, there's okay. ideas of um, roster caps. There's ideas of student athletes becoming employees. I mean, there's so many different changes. I think it's, it's such a, it's going to be a really interesting, um, you know, chapter for college sports because every single day, the situation is going to change. But right now, yes, it's four to have scholarships. Uh, you know, there, there's there's a lot of moving parts, and and I do think we're going to see some some changing tides. Um, and yeah. and I think what what does that mean? I think it's important to still build relationships. And if a prospective student athlete feels that connection with a coach, then they've got to, they've got to harness that. And if a prospective student athlete and a coach don't feel that bond or that trust in each other then I, I think you've got to look into go separate different ways. But what we've tried to do is making sure that the people who belong at SMU and fit the right profile, those are the kids we want to target and recruit. And same thing. I want to encourage any student to try to identify schools that make sense for them because what sounds good on paper may not be what reality is, but you have to make sure your expectations are absolutely aligned. You have to make sure your mission is aligned. You have to make sure that what you're looking for in the school, the school can provide and vice versa. So I think most students, I don't think they go in depth enough in the recruiting process. And, so and I think that's. Go, would, would the official visits be, is that what you're referring to? Like maybe no, spending I, more time figuring thoughts on the visits or is that even beforehand? I, I think all of it. I think the more conversations you can have, the more crossovers, the more interactions you can have, the better. But I, I think you've got to have the hard conversations. What is your goal? I want to turn pro. How can I be, uh, how can I help the program? How can you help me develop as a, a young man, a player, an athlete, a tennis person? How do we help get there? I've helped tennis players learn how to, separate their white laundry with their color laundry because they, they no, had never done not. it before. You know, I, I've helped, I've helped players try to negotiate their contracts with a um, clothing company, even if it's only for, you know, $500 or a thousand dollars. And I think every tennis player who's aspiring. You want to be our agent for our podcast or what? Yeah. Help us. <laughs> hey, help you. us. <laughs> Let's go. Let's, I'll, I'll sign papers now. Changeovers. I'll represent you guys. Um, but, but I think even more than that, you know, you've got to find you've got to find that connection, you know, and, and to be able to understand how everyone plays a role. You know, you, you guys have all been impacted by coaches and friends and other tennis players 
to help get you to this point. You, we can't do it alone. And that's what I think, you know, you guys have done together as, as someone watching you guys and seeing you guys and knowing you for, for quite a few years, you guys all support each other on the road. You share rooms, you cut expenses, uh, rent to cars, and you try to support each other when training and practice and drills because you need that. We might not, if we can afford a coach, maybe the coach is busy that week and isn't with us. So we got to find ways to do drills together and help each other with our games. And then also, you know what, how, how important it is, is companionship to having a companionship on the road to, you know, Hey, look, let's go to the grocery store. Let's pick up dinner together. We'll go back to the hotel. We'll, we'll hop in the pool. We'll play a little ping pong and let's go to bed. That companionship is so pivotal because that state of mind of, of at tournaments, it can be very lonely and isolating, but if you can do it and enjoy that ride together, then I think we've already been successful. Hey guys, quick break. Justin here from The Changeover. We're gonna talk about Pro Stringer. It's a great machine that I use, Jody uses, and a lot of other pros use as well. You can use it at home, on the road, really anywhere there's a tabletop surface. It takes me about 25, 30 minutes to string a racket on this machine. It is easy to travel with. Fits in carry-on, suitcase, tennis bag, no issues at TSA. It's a big money saver. And you can save even more when you use our code changeover to get $100 off the machine. Back to the episode. Yeah, that's and true. Grant, um, NIL, can you explain how it sort of works? Like, what are the rules there and how it's affected the recruiting process? Yeah, well, no, look, it, it is, um, it's changed the game. NIL stands for name, image, likeness. And the idea is uh, student athletes can be compensated or, or, or paid to do certain things, you know, and that could be everything from endorsements to clinics, to autograph sessions, to camps, to teaching lessons, to, you know, even just receiving money for doing, you know, being on the team or playing or, you know, it, it's, it's changed the game. Uh, what does that mean? I, I think it's become, you know, very similar to pro sports. And now you have uh, athletes looking for, you know, bargaining chips and, and having that conversation. And, and I think it's okay to have that conversation, but right now the issue is it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, inflated market. No one really knows what the value of a, a tennis player is. Um, but I also think value is in the eye of the beholder. So, you know, I might value this player uh, more than someone else, for example, or that player might think they're worth more than they think they are getting. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's crazy how it's evolved. But, you know, right now it's legal to be able to compensate athletes or for them to be getting deals. Um, a lot of them can sign NIL agents who can help them find deals. But along those lines, again, it, it, it all comes back down to branding and marketing. What is this player about? Are you just endorsing this granola bar because they're paying you? Or are you endorsing this granola bar because you believe in it and you actually consume it? Or even simple as um, supplements, apparel, rackets, string. There's so many things out there that are tied into the business of tennis. But they also need to see a huge return on investments. People pay the top pros because of their visibility, because of their following, because of their social media platform. You know, and, and again, I think we need to all remember that is you're not just going to get compensated because you have a nice forehand. Yeah, you that's know, what I'm curious get about with these NIL stuff. Like they, I mean, f how are these people going to get a return on investment so far? Because so far, are these NIL investments coming from boosters of the schools or like? It, it, it could it could be coming from anybody. Um, boosters and donors are, are probably really a common source. But uh, again, that's. That's the return on investment. Maybe the return on investment is something as simple as, you know, they just want the team to win. The team do well, but, yeah. But but that's where I also think we're entering a very slippery slope because you can't just buy players, you know. And and if you can, you know, I, I think fundamentally that's kind of going a, a little bit against what college sports is about because I think college sports is about being a student athlete. And fundamentally, I, I think that's about getting an education first and foremost. Yes, you're still going to be a, a good tennis player, All-American, 
you know, you can still win college titles, but I really do believe that being a college student athlete is also about learning the classroom and also interacting with students and professors and colleagues. And that those life lessons you learn in your three, four, five years of college, you're going to be able to take with you on the road and have with you forever. So, you know, look, I, I think we need to have some parameters put in place. That's certainly up to the NCAAs and for them to set those guidelines and boundaries of what that looks like. But, you know, we need to be able to understand. So I'm still trying to identify the right players that fit SMU from academics to tennis, to uh, values, to family values. I think these are all important, essential conversation pieces. Athletes need to be asking coaches, you know, what's your coaching style? What's your expectation? What are your demands? What are your, what are, what are non-negotiables? You know, my non-negotiables are, I, I want tremendous effort, positive communication, all the other stuff we can work on. You know, I mean, you know, Jody, you're struggling with, uh, you know, your serve. Okay. We'll work on that. We'll Never. work on that all day, Just all kidding. night, all week, all year. But, you know, to be able to think that I'm going to change your values or your fundamental principles or your work ethics is probably a much different conversation. So, you know, I, I think we've got to all work towards trying to help the common goal. But NIL, yes, it, it's a major topic right now. It's really changed college sports. And I think it continue to will change it. Um, and we'll see how that evolution ends up. Yeah. Because I, th- I got to um, imagine one... this. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, oh, no, another no. thing about the, N- the NIL is, do you think it separates the schools? Like, separates the schools that are already decently funded and have momentum, meaning, like, they're one of the top tennis programs or whatever, to the, like, mid-major schools or the schools that don't have. Like, for example, my school, we were okay at best, and we didn't have 4.5 scholarships. So we didn't even have the full amount of scholarships available for a men's program. And then now you also throw in NIL. I right. again kind of get the feel that separates it even more. You know, so how no, I mean, is that one of the issues you think? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a very good point. You know, I, I do think that it, it will separate the haves to the have nots, you know, who's well funded, who has resources. But I think every coach needs to also understand and map out what their objectives are. You know, winning, winning is, is it everything? Is it part of it? You know, I've been part of teams that were ranked one and two in the country. And, you know, you lose in the finals of the NCAAs or you have uh, something happens and it's the end of the world. It's the worst season ever. And you just finished two in the country. So it, it really has to do with perspective. And, uh, but what we are working towards, you know, I think every coach needs to determine what exactly they're trying to accomplish with their team. I still think it is about educating student athletes from 18 to 22 years old. I still think that's a fundamental principle of what we need to be doing and helping them be set up for success down the road. I mean, I'm sure you guys, I know I did a lot of the things I learned in college I'm doing now. But I've also learned and evolved since then because these life lessons are sometimes so more valuable than uh, what you learn in the classroom. Because it's not just reading something in a textbook. It's not just online school. It's not just handing in a, a, an exam or a quiz. It's about learning some real hard life lessons and, and showing some resiliency to then overcome that. So, you know, these are all really important things, I think. but. I think teams need to real, really understand what they're still striving for. You know, do we want to be successful? Yes. Do you know, is winning nice? Yes. But we also want to go. Our mission is much larger than that. It's, it's really, I think to develop these student athletes. And when we put that in place, I think they will be successful. Yeah. Is it not just for tennis? I know you look at football, basketball, whatever sport, you're going to probably have some players making close to what the coach makes. How how would a coach go about, let's say, keeping that, I guess, authoritarian, uh, I guess, hierarchy when the athlete is like, 
I don't know. I don't know. Money isn't everything, but it's not, we're humans, and I think that your value it it definitely creates a sort of hierarchy of let's say importance. And how do you go about making sure that you don't end up with the let's say the right tennis player but the wrong person? Like how do you bro? And yeah. you, even or there. even among teammates. Or even among yeah. teammates. Imagine the yeah. number one and number two has NIL deals and making these amounts of money. The other yeah. guys, yeah. you know what I mean? The dynamics are kind of interesting, I feel like, when you throw money into the situation. Apart from scholarships, it's now it's like, I'm actually making 150, 200K, whatever it is. And now this guy's going to tell me I need to do X, Y, Z, and I make more than him. Like, who is he talking to? I, I feel like that's... Yeah. That, that could be a real thing. Like, how would you deal with no, that? The, the podcast no. is so easy when we're making no money, so we have no yeah. issues, you know? Throw <laughs> some yet. money into the podcast <laughs> and see how it goes. Yeah. Uh, but I think great question, really a good question. And I think part of that has to rely on, you know, the recruiting process. Because if everything is transactional and money-based, I think it's going to be hard. The other thing that I also think is important to realize, and it's easier said than done, but I think comparisons is, is one of the worst, toughest things you can do. Because if I'm always going to compare, hey, uh, Justin's backhand, one-handed backhand is way nicer than mine. You know, and then oh, do I feel sorry for myself? You know, but I, I think we always need to focus on what we have. What are the opportunities we have? What are, what are the resources we have? And, and what do we make with the most of what we have? You know, I, I, I was never really a gifted tennis player. I wasn't very talented. My brother got all those genes, um, but I happened to love the game a lot. I, I worked harder. I practiced harder. And, uh, you know, look, I, I got as far as I could. But, you know, to be able to be in a job that I love, be compensated and, and have a salary for something that I enjoy doing, I already feel very blessed. But I think being able to... If you start comparing yourself to one another, you know, I, I think that's a very slippery slope to go down. And I think it's something that you're going to really just find out, uh, you know, not not much good is going to come out of that. So I think for for the athletes and, and, and your teammates, you know, look, focus on what you can do. Your teammate gets an NIL deal or gets an A on an exam or, you know, gets a big tournament win. Let's be happy and proud of them. Because your day is going to come as well. And we're all going to celebrate our small victories in one way or another. Mm. So, you know, the other day I, I, I had a player who, it, it was amazing. They ended up holding serve. We, you know, we had a couple things we were focusing on. They lost the match. But the three things they were working on, they achieved. So in my eyes, that's a win. That's a victory. That's a successful day. And the next time that that comes up, yeah, okay, they'll hopefully be on the, the win side of the match. But today, they accomplished what they were working towards, even though the scoreline said that they lost. So, you know, look, if you start comparing yourself to what Roger has and what I don't have, you know, I, I think it's just you, you can never stop that game. And there's always going to be someone higher ranked than you. There's always going to be someone wealthier than you with more resources than you, with a nicer car than you. and you know, it, it just, you know, I have a jet. Okay. Well, someone else has a bigger jet when that person has a bigger jet. So, you know, I have one house. Well, I have two houses. Well, now I have five houses. So I, I think if we embrace what we have and the resources that, that we already possess, I, I think that's good enough. Yeah. Justin, do you have anything else on NIL? Cause I have a question about some criticism about college, college coaching. There's a lot of those, so we, we might need to carve out. That might be second two. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, we'll just talk about one of them. All right, go on, Justin. Go sorry, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so one of the criticisms that I would say for high-performing athletes, let's say you're an athlete, uh, I don't know, let's say top 150 ITF, and you have pro aspirations. One of the criticisms of college tennis is that I've heard is that, and I, I somewhat agree, is that the coaching staff, they need to win today. They, they want to win the match today. They want to short-term success. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, what is the philosophy, I guess, for you guys at SMU? Or do you have any experience in that over the years? Do you, at UCLA, obviously, there's a lot of pros now that have played through the system. So maybe 
UCLA, UCLA was a little bit different in, in the sense that they developed the athletes over time, over the four years and, and beyond. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, about college tennis, the criticism of college tennis being sure, results-oriented sure. I mean, for today? I, I think a very valid uh, assessment, I, and I think it's a, it's a good point that you bring up, and, and I think some coaches do feel that way. Um, I try to really look at the time over four years um, and, and I think what you, we all realize is it, it's taken time, you know, to, to get to where we are. I mean, you know, Justin, Justin, you know, we, we start by wanting to make a college team. Then we make a college team Then we want to make the starting lineup. Then we make the starting lineup. Then after that, we want to play number top three. And after that, we, got, we, we want to play number one. And then we play number one. We want to be all American. You know, you want to make NCAA individuals. You want to, you know, before you get your first point, everyone's fighting for that very first point. All you, all I want is a point. Then it's all I want to do is make main draw. <laughs> oh, then all I want to do is make challengers. So this is a marathon. This absolutely is a marathon. And if you think we're going to have success overnight, then, then we have to change that mindset. I don't believe in overnight success. I really don't. Um, some players have had very meteoric rise uh, very, very quickly. And I think that's amazing. Um, and But I think those are anomalies. So, you know, to see someone go from juniors and have success in the pros and then um, college and then college to pros, uh, it, it, it happens. But I, I think those are the exceptions to the rule. I think for the most part, you've got to do your time. You've got to try to learn from every single loss every single day. And you've got to try to put your best foot forward, you know, and if, if we can come out of that thinking we've accomplished something, that's great. You know, you guys have had an amazing. I mean, I, I never got a point. I never got one single ATP point. You guys, have, you've done so much. You guys have represented your country and Davis cup. I mean, these are, these are some of the most amazing accomplishments you could possibly have. So we're always striving for more, but I think we have to pace ourselves and remember that this is absolutely a marathon. So the college route, yes, I, I, you know, I think people want wins now, but also that's why I think people are, those coaches might be recruiting with different parameters. I'm yeah. looking at, Hey, what, what could potentially be down the road next season, the following year, your junior year, your senior year. So I'm always trying to, to, to look at the big game and the holistic picture. Um, and, and sometimes it pans out, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. But if my guys have graduated and, and they, they're they better than when they entered, you know, and, and, I, and I can look that they, they were better, it, it's, I think that's a good promising start. Yeah. Have you ever had an experience where, let's say the team is really good this one year and there's a certain player who you guys kind of need and let's say he has a bit of an injury or something that he's been dealing with the whole year and it might be better for him as an individual to maybe rest the next few months or we're coming into like a very pivotal time of the season and we can give him some injections where we can do something to keep him playing and it kind of backfired and, and let's say it hurt him in the long run or have you always been good at, let's say, putting the player and their personal needs over needs of the team? I think if you put the best interest of the player, you're probably going to have the best interest of the team and vice versa. I think these are these are conversations you have to have together. I'm not going to make a player play if they can't play, mm -hmm. but I've also had I, I've also had players who are like, "You're not taking me out." Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there was a couple years ago. I think, honestly, I actually think we got to the semis of the NCAA's. If I remember correctly, Adrian Pouget, 2014, I believe. I think he took off January, February, March. And he wanted to come back end of April. And I think that season, I, I think he sat out most of the year to get ready for the final three weeks of the season. No and, way. you know, and on one hand, it was like, hey, maybe you should redshirt. And then on the other hand, it was like, it was like, no, it's in the best interest of uh, he wanted to play. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think you have to have that conversation together. Uh, but. You know, I'm going to finish this train of thought, but, you know, I might actually pull a guest guest to come on the podcast to join you two in a minute. 
I'm going to yeah. see if he wants to join in. I think he's nodding his head yes, because I think he knows who I'm talking to. But uh, but I think this is where we've got to – got to have a conversation together and to be able to discuss with the player, with – does this make sense? Because if I tell Justin, you have to play tomorrow and you're not ready to play, well, then it doesn't matter anyways. But if you want to play and you're ready to play and you're going to compete and you want to compete, then we're going to be okay. Because I could also put you out there and then you go and essentially tank the match. Well, that you doesn't help lose, You probably lose the locker room a little bit too as a coach. And, and you probably and you probably do. So, you know, I think it's as as the leaders and captains and role models and coaches, we have to take all the information we possibly have and try to make the best educated choice we can with the with the parameters we have to work with. So those are the that's how I approach decision making with the team. And that's what I'm trying to do because again, if I'm putting someone on the tennis court who shouldn't be playing, that that does nobody any good. It doesn't do the yeah. player good. It doesn't do the team any good. But if we can have that collaborative conversation with the player, and you know the player comes to me like, I'm ready. I got this. I'm ready to go. I feel good. The trainer says yes. Strength coach says yes. Everyone says yes. Then let's do it. Mm. So, hang on. You are you hopping in? Yeah, let's do it. Uh oh, Joshua got, Sheehy. Uh oh, uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> we see enough of you, Josh. You can't get Grant a little camera time. You know, we, well, I, it's been like four days. Yeah, I, I, I knew he was gonna. I knew he was gonna hop in here at some point. You know, but you know, everyone knows this familiar face. He's been uh, crushing it out there and has to carry Jody every now and then. You know. That is but, true. That is true. But but it's fun, you know. I mean, even you know, I I, I think what I really love, um, what, what we've done here. I mean, and, and Josh Josh has been around a lot is is to be able to create an environment that everyone wants to get better and and be at and train at. It's funny on uh, Instagram. One of the questions Josh said to ask you why is he your favorite player at SMU, and I was thinking, Josh, you don't even play for freaking SMU. You're not even an SMU player, bro. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, it's it's so funny. Uh, at the Dallas event, you know, two weeks ago, you know, Josh, uh, you know, whatever Josh needed, he got. Whatever the whatever yeah, the home Josh guys was... needed, they got. Adam Neff yeah, Josh... just walked in. Ernesto Escobedo just walked in. I mean, this place, you never know who's going to show up at this tennis <laughs> complex on any given yeah. day. So, exactly. But you know, Josh, uh, during the Dallas event and, and all these guys, you know, it was like a home tournament. They want three, four cans of balls. Sure, take it. No, nah, no problem. Diva, three cans of balls Diva. at the futures. Three cans of balls at the futures is unheard of. Sometimes you don't even get one. Josh, Josh, the other day, he he was about to play. He was like, "Dude, what color Gatorade is in the cooler?" So I'm like, "Blue." He's like, "Oh, okay, good. That's what I wanted." Okay, that works. I was like, yeah. "No, no problem, Josh. Blue, blue Powerade. We got it." So, Josh is on nil. Nah, uh, yeah, he's got he's got a big nil deal. Being recruited. He that. <laughs> he's taking five years off, but boom, there we go. So was it man. tactical, Josh? You knew you, you knew you were having the podcast. You came on now. You knew the this what? was happening. Or this happened by no, chance. I had no idea. I just walked in here to come get my bag, and I I didn't even know it was you guys. Actually, he he, he heard that beautiful soothing voice of his doubles partner, and he's like, <laughs> I, I, I know that voice. No, he needs no. a break. Josh needs a break from his double. Josh dropped me for PK next week, so I don't even have a double spot in the next week. Aren't you playing Davis? Oh no, that's this weekend. That's this weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but PK that's not will. There's no way you're playing doubles next week after playing four singles matches this week. You you got four no, singles. No, you got you got the whole court to cover. <laughs> no, I played I played two already, and I have two more to go. So he's struggling. The full court. The full court, every single corner of it. I'm so sore right now. I'm unbelievably <laughs> sore right now. Joe, Jody's taking the next two, the rest of July and August off for sure. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Ice bath every day. <laughs> I, I spent, get last the night, physio ready. Night, huh? Last night I got over eight hours sleep and I recorded 40% recovery on my whoop. I slept unbelievable 40%. I need a few more hours. We got to push back that practice time, you know, from 9 a.m. to noon. No, that's exactly what we did. We we're supposed to leave at 7.30 on the 7.30 bus. I said, we're leaving at 9. We're taking a 9 o'clock bus over to the course to practice today. I need to sleep in. J Jody's like the uh, Jody's like the Alcaraz of the, the, the Davis Cup team, you know? He, but they move mountains for him, you know? That's what <laughs> That's I've been told. Actually. 
they do what they can. They do what they can. Everything stops. They're like, yeah, Jody's pushing back practice. The whole team's got to wait. He ne- no. Sleep- Sleeping Beauty needs 90 more minutes for whoop recovery. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. Wow. You know, uh, my coach was saying yesterday that, like, we were talking about discipline and, like, efforts. And I told him, like, I think I work hard, but I don't think I'm the most disciplined. Meaning, if I have to create my own schedule and I have to do my own fitness and stuff, I'm maybe not the most disciplined to do that. But if you tell me to show up at 9 o'clock and, and, and to perform and train and do whatever, I'll do it. And then he was saying that a lot of the time, guys who are disciplined and work hard don't even realize how disciplined and how hard they work. And it's so different to to other people. So I say this to say that the rest of my team are not full time tennis players, and these guys, it's a whole other world for them to come and train for forty five minutes a day, hit some balls, and they think that they're successful, and they think that they yeah. they had a fulfilling day. But for me, I hit forty five minutes today, and I was like, I probably wouldn't really do this if I was on tour. I would have a more structured day and and take the day more seriously. So. Yeah, this week at Davis Cup, I'm just I know that we're just doing what we can and they do all they can to accommodate me and make sure I'm comfortable. They help me with everything. It's kind of like what you said a little bit. Like they help me make sure I have enough towels and waters and that sort of stuff. Because if I lose, we go down, you know? So so it is it is a fun week, I'll say. Uh hey, let's let's do something real quick. I'm gonna flip the script on you guys because Josh is here. So Jody, Josh, we're going to kind of figure this out as, as two guys, you guys have played a lot of matches together. Okay. So we're going to kind of see if you guys have similar answers. Okay. Um, Deuce point. Who's taking it? Who, who answers me or Josh? I'm asking both of you guys. If you guys have the same deuce point for all, who's taking it? I would say most of the time. Sorry, go on. You, you go, Josh, you go. Fire away. Like 60-40, me to you. Yeah. Do you I agree? agree? I was saying I was saying most of the time Josh takes it unless um for whatever you're, reason I'm you're, I'm heating it up. You're you're feeling it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which is um which is almost never. So I would say more like 70 30. <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> you know, Justin uh, right, told me Justin told me Justin told me like two weeks ago he said he said like um or maybe it was last week in Michigan. He said like I just wanted to say like you look a lot more confident on returns. Like I've never seen you actually be like I'll take the deuce points or whatever. I'm like that's not really what happened. I'm glad that it looks that way, but it's more like <laughs> me going to Josh. All right, Josh, what do you think? No, I've never said that. I say Josh, what do you think? And then he'll say, oh, I think you're feeling it right now, and I'll be like, All right, I'll take it. You know. Uh, who's more likely to lose their passport at the airport? Josh. I'm not I'm losing my passport. Here. Okay. I'm not All losing right. my passport. Well, Ooh. someone has to lose it, and it's not me. So. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> Who's serving first in the match? Me. Okay. Are we choosing up or down on the coin toss? Uh, it depends. It depends. Uh, well. Switch. Depends on what? What do you mean the coin? Oh, on the coin toss. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I say yeah. Up heads. Yeah. You're you're choosing heads. Yeah, heads. I choose heads. I you, cho- you choose heads. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um. You guys, you guys can't decide between the going to tournament A or tournament B. How do we decide uh, what what event we end up at? <laughs> well, I've been cooked of recent because I'm, I'm actually kind of I have to go where Josh wants to go because Josh still plays singles. <laughs> Like, I, like we played, we played some fifteens, uh, in Jamaica and end up working out. We won two of the three fifteens, and then we played some in Tunisia where we final one. And at the time, I wanted to play twenty fives and try to get into challenges if we could. But Josh wanted to play. Um, it was a good opportunity for him to play some fifteens, so that's what we did. Luckily, we we did really well and we maximized pretty much most of the weeks. So, but like. Let's get into the point where we have to make some decisions, like try and see if we can sneak into some doubles when we can in, in the in the challenges. But so far, it's all, it's all Josh. But, you know, I, I think that's something for the fans and the listeners to realize is the tournament schedule is, I mean, you just, you might as well just throw a dart at the globe and see where it lands because sometimes you just don't know what to play or where to play or, or what event to do because, you know, where do I get in? And then this happens. And then, okay, then I don't play doubles or I only play doubles. Or I, you know, I mean, it, it, it really is kind of a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, exactly. That's true. Yeah. All right. All right. So 
Lastly, who's okay. most likely to serve to the back of the their partner's forehead in I formation? Jody, That's are you tough. more likely to hit Josh or Josh is more likely Jordan, to hit you? Somebody hit somebody else in the East Lansing tournament. Somebody, I think Jody got hit with a ball that Josh hit. Yeah. Really? You remember? I, I, I would say but I'm that was a ground. That was oh, a ground stroke. No? I, just, I, just remember, I just remember you getting hit. I don't, I just remember Jody they, getting hit. They've like definitely I been times. <clears throat> they've definitely been times with Josh Surs and I hear it on my hat, like, like some of my oh, hat, like the full I hit your racket. <laughs> Remember you were at the net and I tried to go cross court and it hit your racket because I went yeah maybe cross court. Uh oh maybe. So I would say I'm more likely to hit you because yeah, I also call, Josh I, does this. I also call I formation more. That's true. Uh, but Josh also does this thing where where he'll try to like out trick the opponent. <laughs> so like he'll be behind in a rally and he'll think oh my opponent's gonna poach because he sees me half volleying and then Josh will try to go. Like half volley down the line or something, and then the guys but, just sitting there like this, just ready to destroy. You know? <laughs> Banana hook forehand. Yeah, exactly. But oh sometimes it works. Sometimes it works. I mean, he. Yeah. I don't know if he told you that we ended Michigan hitting three return winners in a row to win the match. Like Josh hit the return winner. I hit the return winner. Josh hit the return winner. That's how we won the tournament. Did were were your eyes open? <laughs> Mine was not. Mine. Okay. That's just, I was just. Asking for a friend, just for our hey, viewers. If it went to, really to Deuce, help. if it went to Deuce, I was going to Josh and I'll say, "All right, Josh, what do you think?" And he would probably say, "I'm feeling good." <laughs> okay, so There's no chance I'm taking it. Lastly, eight all third set tiebreaker. Are we gonna go return cross or return line, or cross bump lob? Cross. I'm cross. going cross. You're going cross. Okay. All Big right. fundamental. <laughs> yeah. Look at that yeah. fundamental. And all high percentage doubles. Yeah, that'll be Jody. Yeah. Be Jody. <laughs> right. I got one for you. Yeah, I got one more over or under for you. Underrated. Okay. Work life, work life balance, and I say this because you have a team over there. But I don't know how many players you got. You got our boy Jerry Barton over there. You got Travis Vida, Adam Neff. You got the pro team. You got your wife. You got to run these clinics. All this stuff. But you might be one of the people who has the fastest response time on a text message. Do Brother, you what? Do the you answer right away? Do you sleep? Do you eat? Do you take naps? How do you function? Because you have so much to handle, and you find a way to get back to people very quickly. So I want to know if you think work-life balance is over or underrated. No, I I think work-life balance is huge. I okay. I only can do what I do. Because I think I actually have a balanced life. I know it sounds funny and it probably people think I'm crazy, but you know, when I sleep, I sleep well. When I don't sleep, okay. I'm awake and I'm gonna do something. And uh, you know, I, I think having that balance where, you know, after this week, we we've got a tournament this week, after Sunday, I you guys won't see me for a couple of days. You know, and and I think even just even with the team, I'll, I'll give you a good example. After the men's 25K, which ended on um, July 14th. I basically told the team, I, I don't want to see them for a while, you know, because I, I, I think we all need, we need a break from each other. So when the school year starts up again in August, everyone's excited to see each other. So, you know, I, I think there is a, there is a tremendous balance. And then, you know, sometimes my wife is like, you, you, you know, if I'm home all day Saturday by Sunday, she's like, don't you need to go do something? Like, can you get out of the house? So I think it is important to have. No, a you guys balance. need to miss each other some. <laughs> well, I'm about to go to Kalamazoo for like you know 11 days, so you know, sure. you know she she will uh, have plenty of that opportunity. But um, I think work life balance is important. Um, and and I think one of the, my favorite things is throughout this entire journey is you have some you develop great relationships with people. You know, no matter who you are. I mean, you guys you guys can only see this little box here, but in this locker room behind us, you know, we've got got a lot of ballers in this room hanging out and hearing them this conversation with you guys. But I think it's fun to be able to have those relationships with a lot of great players. I don't hear from some of them for a couple months and then they come back and it's like, we never left. And I think that's what really has been fun. You know, I asked Josh a couple of weeks ago, I was like, Oh God, you know, I think I saw you last week. He's like, Grant, I, I was in Tunisia for a month. I was like, Oh, I mean, yeah, that too, you know, but it felt like he was only gone four days. So yeah. 
I, I, I think this sport is amazing and the relationships we build, um, you got to enjoy it. Cause if you don't enjoy it, then it's not worth doing. And then after that, you know, surround yourself with the people you want to be with and, uh, and everything else will be fine. Yeah. Um, last thing before we go, Grant, do you remember when we first met? Do you remember which, uh, wh where this was or no? You might not have remembered well, this. Well, no, I mean, if, if you're, you're catching me on the spot, but yeah, my, the first initial, time, my initial thought is, uh, um, in SoCal. Well, I, it wasn't okay. Cause I was thinking before that, that. Cap. it was so before you probably that. You wouldn't have remembered me. Yeah. I met you for the first time at Cincinnati. You were traveling with Dimitro. You probably, probably had was, long hair back then. Oh I yeah. Had long that's hair. You were, you were, you were hitting a party. different Jody. Yeah. I was that's a right. Partner, yeah. That's right. Where, My first where experience with you. Uh, the age, go? brother. Age, brother. No, I was, that. Well, listen. That, that is a that's a great town, great city, Mason, yeah. Mason, yeah. Ohio. It's it's not easy to get to, but I, you know what? That's right. I my do first, remember. my first experience with you was so I hit with Grigo like maybe two or three times in the week. But the first time, you just introduce yourself, just like everyone, like normal, whatever. I hit with him. My session was done. I left, went to the next hit. The next time was the second time. It was fine. And then by the end of the week, what you don't know is I've been hitting from like 8 a.m. until 6 p.m. every day. And I live like 45 minutes away from Mason, from the courts. And it it I was hitting with Grigo, I think, before. It was the year he made either finals or semis. He was playing Stan. Do you remember? I think he lost He lost in the semifinals. I think it was the semifinals that year. Yeah, it was either semis or finals. And... I came to hit with him. I left the courts the night before very late because I think Murray was playing last on late night match. And I hit with him, with Grigo in the morning. And I was hitting like shit, like absolute shit. And you came over to me and you're telling me like, come on, man, you got to move your feet. Like you got to <laughs> bend your knees and move your feet. And I'm like, bro, I'm trying my best. Like, and then... <laughs> But oh we that God. was the first that was my first experience with you. You were coming and coaching me when you were on Dimitro's team uh, with him. <laughs> and I think he was so, with the other coach, you know? So th th this is what was really funny about that tournament. So Grigor loses in the semis. Um Murray Andy, I think, wins it. If I if I remember correctly, I think he wins it. So he loses in the semis. He looks at me, he goes, Well, you know, we gotta get to New York. I'm like, all right, well, what do you want to do? Yeah, book a flight. He's like, I got all this luggage. What if we just drove? I'm no. like, I'm like, okay, that's like 11 hours or 10 hours, but sure, I'm a team player and I'll do it. So we we drive 10 and a half hours from Cincinnati the next morning to New York in a Ford Expedition. I had a small duffel bag because I don't check bags. He had eight roll bags. And uh, it's, we had lunch halfway in the middle of West Virginia at like a subway. By the time we got to New York, we were both so exhausted of each other. We did we weren't talking. I mean, it was like both of us got to the hotel and went to bed. So that's funny. No, no, we, we actually traded off. So I would drive two hours. He drove two hours. We just alternated the whole car ride. And I remember Inside part of the ride, I was like, I, I don't even know where we are, guys. I like I, yeah. I hope we make it. So yeah. that that was the funny part. Uh, we drove to New York the very next day, and then you know for the open. So, but guys, thank you. That was yeah. super fun and thanks so much, Grant. First. No, awesome. No, good luck. Good luck with the full court. <laughs> yeah, two more days of it, and then I'm back to Josh. So, <laughs> all right, all right. Well, hey, we'll see you soon, and we'll do this again. Thank all you, right, thanks thank so you, much, Grant. Grant. See you, Josh. Thanks everyone for watching. See you guys. Appreciate it, guys.